Good morning from sunny NYC. Part of my job description is sitting alone in the morning on park benches, watching the world go by. As soon as someone sits down next to me, I stare straight ahead and calmly say, Did you bring the money? They go away. All you need to be a painter is nothing, and most people don't have that. Being a painter is the easiest job on earth, except for the actual painting part. That takes decades of practice. But everything else you need, you already possess, and probably have since the first grade. Your job is to manufacture boredom to gain access to those things. Art is a highly orchestrated form of boredom. If you're in a hurry, you'll miss everything. Patience doesn't produce skill. It is itself a skill. You have to practice it. Well, enough sitting. It's time for breakfast. When asked for his conception of a perfect building, the 14th century painter Giotto drew a circle. I think of that every time I get an everything bagel toasted with butter at my favorite joint. But we'll get back to the bagel in a minute. As I've said before, art is the magnification of limitations. Creativity thrives on restrictions. As the poet Robert Frost wrote, I'd sooner write free verse than play tennis with the net down. If you were given an acre on which to plant a garden, you probably wouldn't be too careful about what flowers went where because you have loads of space. But if you were given a three by three foot garden, you'd probably be more careful because of the space restriction. As painters, we thrive within limitations. You have to know the rules in order to break them. For example, linear perspective is a limitation. All roads lead to the vanishing point, usually through the path of least resistance. A flat two-dimensional pictorial surface is also a limitation, just as a modern piano has 88 keys, yet no two pianists sound alike. When I was at the College of Charleston, my first painting teacher, William Halsey, used to say, Brian, use any colors you want, as long as they're cadmium yellow, ultramarine blue, alizarin crimson, and white. He was imposing restrictions for me so that I would have to extract the maximum amount of poetry from those limitations. One of our most glorious limitations is the painted surface. We spend our days stacking skins of color one on top of another, trying to create light where there is no light and space where there is no space. When you experience a painting, you bring your body to a thing that exists separately from yourself. A painting is a physical thing occupying space in the room, just as the viewer is a physical thing. The poet Wallace Stevens said it best, no ideas but in things. When you understand painting's thingness, you wield a great deal of power. Our allegiance is to the eyes. And our eyes thirst for order from chaos. What the critic Clive Bell called significant form, which is essential to provoking what he calls aesthetic emotion. Bell is very careful not to confuse significant form with beauty, as forms and relations of forms do not need to be attractive in order to register in our emotions. But they do need to be authentic. The most radical thing you can do is be the most like yourself. Quality depends on your mental point of view, not your moral point of view. And I, not told what to see, sees more. I don't want to stand in front of an idea, but a thing that exists separately from myself. Whether you're weaving a basket, juggling knives, or choreographing a dance, you are still willing form into existence. The medium doesn't really matter. It's the delivery system for something far deeper. Contact with otherness. That's what it's all about. Art brings us back into ourselves 
by first making us unrecognizable to ourselves. We see through someone else's eyes. So keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate things. Toilet paper math is complicated enough. I paint because I can never see enough places. Leo Tolstoy wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, all happy families are the same, all unhappy families are different. We are all part of the same show business family. If you back out all of the competitive career bullshit, you'll see that all artists have the same job. We manufacture an experience, put a proscenium around it, and shoot it back into the world to make people feel more alive. That's our job. All happy families are the same. If you want to do this for a long time, then be kind to yourself. Stop trying to be great and just be good. Just do the best that you can each day. What you've lived through lives in you. It might help to think about poetry. All of us use language in everyday life, mostly for communicating prosaic information like ordering pizza or making a dental appointment. But it's rare that we experience language of the highest order, carefully arranged by a poet, not to communicate anything other than the sheer pleasure of form. The same is true for visual experience. We use our eyes all the time to gather information, to know if a bus is coming or if a text is going. But it's pure reverie to contemplate a carefully drawn line or a conversation between three colors with no purpose other than to be contemplated. That's why every mark counts. If it doesn't help, take it out. What's the least amount of information a painting can have and still be a painting? A circle is the classical symbol for unity. Look at any painting and reduce its composition into three spheres like soap bubbles pressed up against each other, large, medium, and small. Simplifying a painting into three groups makes it easier to identify the interrelationship of the parts to the whole, not only by comparing their similarities, but by exaggerating their differences. Likewise, my bagel has large, medium, and small parts. Just as a composition, has large, medium, and small parts. No matter how I assemble and reassemble my bagel, it always forms a whole. A bagel also has a center opening, which represents entry and exit. Every painting should have a way in and a way out. When you reduce a composition into three bubbles, the smallest one is the way in. It's the entry point. It's the focal point which pulls the eye into the composition. Usually by value contrast, the lightest light next to the darkest dark, color contrast, teal next to orange, or an emphasis on resolution and detail. Conversely, the largest bubble usually contains the exit point, and it usually occupies the edges of the composition. For example, this Gustave Courbet painting and this Raphael Sawyer painting use exits very masterfully. Your eye needs a place to squirt out of the composition, otherwise the painting feels like it's holding its breath rather than inhaling and exhaling. More than one exit in a painting is usually the sign of a lousy composition. Not every painting has to have an entry and exit point. For example, Mark Toby and Bridget Riley eliminated the focal point in favor of all over fields which wash over you. That, in breakfast food parlance, would be called a biali.
Great ideas don't always make great paintings. Just stick to the marks and the rest will take care of itself. We work in a visual medium. Clarity and authenticity are critical. The most important thing you need to be a painter is a built-in bulletproof shit detector. Sorry to yuck your yum, but there are no shortcuts to learning how not to paint. In other words, self-awareness kills painting. If you're thinking as you work, I'm making serious important marks here, then you'll end up with attractiveness instead of beauty. Beauty is when there is a cable that runs from your heart to your hand. It doesn't have to be pleasing, but it does have to be honest. This comes from sheer repetitive practice and from destroying as much work as possible. Don't be precious. Trust me, no one cares. One of the things I learned from my old pal, the painter Gregory Amanoff, was the value of making hundreds of tiny ink studies on index cards, which he'd always have scattered around his studio. Usually only three or four marks put down in black ink as swiftly as possible. These help to reduce the composition to the bare essentials of touch. The best way to improve your touch is to practice making marks. Start with a small filbert and try attacking the surface, not head on, but by dragging the brush upward and twisting as you move up. Hit the surface from the side of the brush. Then hold the brush close to the bristles so that your knuckles touch the canvas. Next, move on to fatter brushes, which are harder to be nuanced with. Mine are over 30 years old. Hold the brush in an awkward way, like you're holding the handlebars on a motorcycle. When you give up control, the results often have more vitality. Then try switching hands. I'm a righty, but I often will paint with my left. Check out this beautiful Milton Avery called Old Mountain. He makes no attempt to be realistic, yet, through the vitality of touch, makes the landscape more real than the real world, because it has passed through his consciousness and shoots directly into ours, with nothing in between. The kindest compliment I hear is when folks come up to me and say they don't know what landscape I'm painting, yet they recognize it, as if having been there before. Painters are like pilots. It doesn't matter how many exotic destinations you've flown to. All that matters is flight hours. Practice. Destroy. Repeat. Here are some new paintings from two recent shows. One at Gerald Melberg Gallery in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the other at Lou Allen Galleries in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Although many folks have written me to say that these paintings signal some changes in my work, I can't see it. I just show up every day and make stuff. Self-awareness is the enemy. I've done this long enough to know that good things happen when I get the heck out of my way and let the paintings lead me. Now you might be asking, Bri, you dirtball, what the heck does that mean? How do you let a painting tell you what to do? The answer is to give up on being great and simply aim for good. Destroy more work than you save and you'll know freedom. Don't force the painting to do too many things. The hard part is pushing your work into uncomfortable places while still standing on that little postage stamp sized place that made you an artist to begin with. Close your eyes and without over intellectualizing, clamp on to that thing that made you want to paint in the first place. I'll bet you a cold beer that you possessed it before you were 10 years old. Can you see it? That's your clear seeing place. Run a cable directly from that place into your soft tissue, for it's from that place that you can peer from the edges of grass-skinned lawns and wander the bric-a-brac of shorelines where shells shatter under every step closer to the promise of crossing. 
And that's what these new paintings are about. Crossing. Into what? I have no clue. And I'm so okay with that. To use the imagery of the tidal creeks in the South Carolina Low Country that stole my ten-year-old soul, my paintings ebb and flow between more abstracted compositions to more representational compositions, which tend to reference more traditional schools of landscape, such as this Jane Peterson and this Henry Osawa Tanner. I've been playing with using larger, simpler shapes in my compositions for about the last eight years. Larger forms at the edges help massage the viewer's gaze into the middle of the composition, where the climax lives. The effect is a pulling inward from the physical world, which we all walk around in, to the illusory realm of the invented world. Although I do compose with value lights and darks, the dimensional energy of my work comes from color, forcing colors that don't necessarily go together into harmony through sheer will. This is nothing new and comes from my 30-year study of the 18th century Venetian painter Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, who in his later works shifted from a value-based system of modeling form to one of colors of equal intensity placed side by side. The result is a more elastic and overall displacement of energy, which emphasizes artifice over nature. In other words, bending the laws of nature to fit the laws of art. With this, I believe that Tiepolo, not Cezanne, was the first modern painter. I couldn't do these shows without the talent and hard work of many people, from gallery directors, publicists, registrars, curators, photographers, and framers. After a new body of work is finished, my photographer, Steve Bates, shoots everything, and then my longtime framer, Gerlach Frames in Brooklyn, comes to my studio to build cardboard collars to ensure that the paintings aren't damaged in transit. They trucked them to their shop, where they are framed, packed, and picked up by an art shipper who takes them to the respective galleries. Every single show is a collaborative effort, and I don't forget that. I send many handwritten thank you notes, send flowers, and food baskets every year. Always show gratitude. The only thing weirder than being a painter is the thought of not being a painter. Here's a photograph of me on my third birthday in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, with my father and my Albanian grandparents. My grandfather came over on a boat when he was 18 years old and spoke very little English. When I was growing up, I would often hear the phrase, mostly from other moms, bless your heart, child, which is South Carolina code for I'm going to say a little prayer for your mama. I was quiet and messy. I'm the reason that paper towels are on school supply lists. I was terrible at group activities and really bad at sports. I spent most of my time inside a ficus bush in our backyard talking to graham crackers. And I smiled a lot. A lot. Nothing has changed. I still smile a lot. Not because I'm naive or because I don't care about stuff. On the contrary, I smile for self-compassion. Be kind to yourself. Be generous of heart. Let it show here and also in your paintings. There is nothing weaker than a painter who is hard of heart. That's why I make these YouTube videos, because I believe the world needs to chatter less and stare at each other more. We need to see each other's narratives. I've had a lot of great teachers in my life and they all had one thing in common. A great teacher never forgets what it's like to be a student. An artist has to be two people inhabiting one body, a maker and a teacher. Make something and tell the whole world about it. I've had the pleasure and the honor of speaking about my work to audiences 
all over the place, hundreds of lectures from groups as small as six to 6,000. And every single time I walk out on the stage without fail, I feel like this. I may look like a professional golfer, but I feel like a carnival huckster swindling an audience. That's why I identify with this 1652 painting by the Dutch painter Gerard Du, because at the very basic level, it embodies what all painters do. The artist himself, palette in hand, smirks at us from a dimly lit window on the right, behind a quack doctor who is scamming a crowd carefully assembled at his feet. There's a pickpocket, a pancake trader wiping her baby's bottom, a hunter with a dead rabbit hanging from his gun, and a schoolboy playing hooky. In other words, a typical subway ride. Everyone in the crowd is engaged in some prosaic task, symbolized by the lifeless tree on the left, which is contrasted by the healthy tree festooned with fruit on the right, behind the quack. Even the placement of the quack slash artist at the top of the pyramid indicates a hierarchy, separating the deceivers from the deceived. You and I are deceivers. We make ships in bottles. A work of art serves no practical purpose. It doesn't heat homes or purify water. However, like a ship in a bottle, a work of art's only job is to be the most like itself. Just because you can't measure something with a test or a cost-benefit analysis doesn't mean it has no value. We need deception in our lives. The painter Francis Bacon said, the job of the artist is always to deepen the mystery. When my kids were little and experiencing something for the first time, they would say, Daddy, I love this. This is great. What is this? That's how I live my life. So here's to us, the dreamers. We write on the hearts of logical people and dare to wear the clown face. How boring would the world be if we didn't show up for work? As my teacher used to say, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. Peace out. <laughs>